Uh, I've asked Kerry King to introduce our speaker. Uh, I'm tempted, I was very tempted to do it myself because anybody that meets Mr. Margold is so impressed with him, you wanna be the one that introduces him. But I, I deferred to Kerry. Kerry interviewed him uh, with the uh, Atlanta Senior, uh, I'm sorry, the um, um, uh, Atlanta History Center. And I must do an absolute serious shout out to Sue Verhoff. She is the person once again, that came to our aid and introduced us to Herbert Hilbert, rather. And Sue is awesome in every way, but especially in this case, I'm very, we are all indebted to Sue for making this introduction for us. So Carrie, if you could make an uncharacteristically brief introduction, sufficient, of course, for the occasion, and then we will get the chance to start hearing from uh, Mr. Uh, Margol. Carrie. I'm, I uh, am particularly uh, connected to Mr. Margot both because I had the uh, honor of doing his interview at the Atlanta History Center several years ago, and also because I had personally been to Dachau on two separate occasions. One when I was stationed in Germany in 1964 and 65 before I went to Vietnam. I visited Dachau, and believe it or not, there were ashes still in the ovens in 1965 and all of the barracks still were standing. 2007, I went back and, um, and this is not about me, but I just thought I would sort of give you the connection here. 2007, I went back, they had destroyed all but one of the barracks and uh, there's a memorial room there and they've cleaned everything up, obviously for, for obvious reasons. Um, Mr. Margo, I met at the Atlanta History Center uh, I've also been introduced to him by Sid Stein, who works with a lot of uh, veterans and who had brothers who were killed in World War II. Uh, Mr. Margold is a twin, and he was born in Jacksonville, Florida, on February 22nd, 1924. And his twin's name was Howard, and unfortunately he lost, in 2017, he lost his brother. Um, I think he, he described it as going over the rainbow which I thought was a great description. I'm sure he misses him. Um, his brother's name was Howard. Uh, they graduated high school in 1942 and were immediately uh, applied for and were admitted to the University of Florida in Gainesville and joined the ROTC program at the University of Florida. Um, but in October of 42, they had joined an Army Reserve unit. Both brothers joined. And as Army Reserve units do, they got, because of the war, uh, a few months later, they, the unit got called up to uh, mobilize and uh, actually received their orders on April 3rd, 1943, went through 13 weeks of basic training. Um, I'm not sure where, I'll, I'll ask, uh, Ms. Margo can fill that in for us, I guess. Um, and then they were scheduled in early 1944 to go to some specialized training, which ended up getting canceled. And um, Mr. Margold and his brother, uh, Howard, had both been in the same unit and kind of wanted to stay together. But at that point, they were split up into different units. And um, in early 1944, which I think this is one of the interesting, really interesting parts of the story, is... Um, Hilbert and his brother Howard's mother wrote a letter to uh, FDR requesting that they both be in the same unit, which was contrary to the rules at that point of combat that you weren't supposed to have two brothers in the same unit. FDR wrote her back and granted their request, uh, which is also a bit of an anomaly, I think. <laughs> I think uh, there have been people that have written their congressmen and gotten nowhere. They were both in a 105 battery, originally in Oklahoma. And um, Hilbert, I guess you can answer this when, it's your, when you get a chance to speak, but I'm sure it was Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And um, I'm wearing my artillery red shirt in honor of your artillery background. And we have a lot of, that was my original MOS as well. And I did command a 105 battery in combat. So we're glad to have a good artilleryman here. Um, they were deployed, the unit was deployed to Marseille in, and they arrived in January of 1945. Their first combat was in Wingen sur Moder, which is in France, followed by uh, campaigns in, in the Alsace and um, 
Ardennes uh, Valley and the Rhineland campaign in Germany. They were present at the liberation of Dachau base camp. And I know he's going to tell you about that. I'm not base camp. I'm sorry. Concentration camp, prison camp, my, my error. And they were on May 8th, 1945, uh, on VE Day, um, they were deployed to Austria as occupation troops, specifically to Salzburg. March of 1945, um, the unit came home. They were discharged in April 1946, I believe, or they, excuse me, March 46, they came home and he was discharged in April 1946. And he proudly stated in his bio that he uh, retired his military service as a PFC. And um, Hilly, with that, I wanna again, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to interview at the History Center. And thank you for sharing with us today. And now perhaps you can fill in the details. Well, first thing I'd like to say, can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. sir. Yeah, we can hear you fine. First thing I'd like to say is all veterans within hearing distance, I want to thank you for your service. Uh, I'll start by saying, as Carrie already mentioned, uh, as you know, Pearl Harbor occurred December 7th, 1941. About five or six weeks later, we graduated high school, Jacksonville, Florida. After about a week at home, we entered the University of Florida as freshmen, Gainesville, Florida. And um, we joined the Army Reserve Unit, which was called to active duty in October of 1942, uh, ordered to report Camp Landing, Florida, in April 3rd, 1943. From there, we were assigned to basic training, 13 weeks of basic training at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Uh, next, next picture. This is a picture of me, as you can see at the ROTC University of Florida, horse-drawn artillery. Our horses were real. That's why I'm uniform is riding pants known as jumpers and um, the howitzers were real but our guns our rifles were made out of wood that's how prepared we were for combat next picture uh, after 13 weeks of basic training we were interviewed offered the opportunity to go to ocs school we asked the interviewer, what was that about? He said, well, in three months, you'll come out both as second lieutenants. In those days, they called them 90-day wonders. We discussed it briefly and decided, well, if we did that, they certainly would split us up. They wouldn't put us in the same outfit. So we said, what else is next? And he said, well, they just started in this Army Specialized Training Program. You can go back to college, courses in engineering for some bright person in Washington decided that the army would lose a lot of engineers in combat and the country would be short of engineers after the war. So we went to Syracuse University for four or five months in the fall of 43. And from there, they transferred us to the University of Illinois in uh, Champaign-Urbana. And uh, few months there, they decided to cancel a program because they had thousands of healthy young soldiers in colleges. They needed to combat. So from there, they sent us, they, that's when they split us up. They sent my brother Howard to the 104th Timberwolf Division Desert Training in the Mojave Desert in California. Uh, they decided after a couple of months there, they didn't need them for the North African campaign. So then they transferred that division to Colorado, Pikes Peak area for mountain training to get ready for the Italian campaign. Meanwhile, I'm at the 42nd Infantry Division in Camp Gruber, Oklahoma. And um, we wanted to get together, 
Howard kept uh, at putting in a transfer to his captain to transfer to my outfit. And uh, after three requests, nothing happened. He asked his captain for the status of his transfer request. And the captain said, my job is to train you, not transfer you. Uh, the captain knew at that point that the unit, the division was going to be the first division to ship direct to France after D-Day. Of course, the enlisted men had no knowledge of that. He didn't want Howard to be replaced by some fresh kid out of basic training. Uh, that's when he wrote a letter home and our mother wrote to President Roosevelt, wanted us to be together. And as the letter stated, as a two-star mother, her request would be granted but it didn't say who's going where. A couple weeks later, she got another letter from the War Department basically saying the same thing. And the third letter arrived from the headquarters of the 104th Division issuing orders for Howard to transfer to my outfit. That's when we said hallelujah. Howard joined my outfit. We shipped over in December, late December, of 1944 and arrived in Marseille, France in uh, January of 1945. Uh, after some delay, we joined our division complete in combat in Wien sur Mode of France and moved northward in different cities, towns in France till we crossed over into Germany, I guess that was late February or early March, 1945. Uh, next picture. Uh, the next picture, uh, this is, uh, there was a German air, air base, first Germany outside of Nuremberg. And one of the storage buildings my brother Howard went in and found a stack of German parachutes. Of course, it was winter time. Took his bayonet and cut off enough material to make a nice neck scarf. Uh, at that time, our gun positions were quite a distance apart. It depended on the terrain. Some situations, our poor howitzers were close together. Sometimes we could see each other and sometimes they were quite a distance apart. I say, depending on the situation, especially the terrain. Of course, when I met up with Howard some days later and I saw his white scarf, he didn't make one for me. I was not a happy brother, I can tell you. Next picture. This is for me, of course, as a gunner on a 105 millimeter howitzer. We had the four howitzers in the gun battery. Howard was gunner on number two. I was a gunner on number three. Next picture. We'll skip this water can going to, because that's a story we'll save for later if time permits. Next picture. Okay. We're on a two lane road headed towards the next military objective was Munich, capture Munich, Germany. And this was after, of course, seeing various action and activities and uh, we're on this two-lane road and uh, we got orders to pull over on the right side of the road. There was a small clearing just enough to accommodate our four howitzers. And we set up, we fired some missions towards Munich, which we were eight to 10 miles north of Munich. And everybody smelled a very strong odor. And one of our Jeep drivers came over and said, must be a chemical factory on the west side or the left side of the woods. And uh, my brother Howard came over and said, no, it reminds him when we were growing up, our mother would go to a meat market and buy a freshly killed chicken. In those days, you had to buy the entire chicken. You couldn't buy it to parts like you can today. And that result was, Howard said it reminded him when our mother would take that chicken home 
she would hold it over the gas flame of a stove in the kitchen. And of course, in doing so, to burn off the remaining pin feathers, it would burn the skin and some of the fat of the chicken. And he said, that's the odor it reminds him of. I asked my gun sergeant, could Howard and I go over through the woods on the left side and determine what was the cause of the odor? So he gave me permission, but he said, don't take long. So Howard and I walked through the woods, short distance, and the first thing we saw was a line of railroad boxcars. Now, next picture. We didn't know at the time of what we were about to see. This particular picture, I'll get a little ahead of the game. Uh, this was April 29th, 1945. About 2.30, that afternoon was when the official surrender took place. It just so happened the day before on the 28th, Victor Maurer of the Swiss Red Cross arrived with a couple of truckloads of provisions, talked to the SS general in charge of the prisoner camp, which adjoined the, uh, of the German army camp, which was a huge army camp, which I'll show in just a minute or two, that controlled the prisoner camp, told the SS general the U.S. Army was coming close. He had two choices. He could remain with his men and fight against overwhelming odds or arrange the peaceful surrender of the camp and save a lot of lives. The SS general, being no dummy, decided he would arrange peaceful surrender of the camp the next day, the 29th, leaving a junior lieutenant, a Lieutenant Weikert, Heinrich Weikert in charge. Took most, all of his SS officers and most of the German troops and left, claiming they were gonna go head to Munich to defend Munich, which also turned out to be a lie because they really wanted to end up in the Austrian Alps and from there maybe escape to wherever they could. Next picture. This is the uh, camp on the right, you can see is the prisoner camp. On the left is a much, much larger uh, army, German army camp, uh, which all, everything they had that they needed, a hospital, barracks, uh, whatever they needed, supply depot. Uh, some of the SS officers especially had their wives and children living with us, living with them on that camp. They, are, of course, were exposed to a lot of things that happened. You can't uh, really tell, but up in the upper corner of the army camp was where the crematorium was located. Not, it was not located in the prisoner camp. There was a, at that, and I'll show pictures later of what the crematorium looked like, the inside and so forth. Next picture. We'll skip these uh, signs because uh, it not, I guess most people can read it, but okay, this is the first thing we saw when we saw a train load of 40 to 50 boxcars, railroad boxcars. Uh, we crawled over between two of the boxcars to see what was on the other side. This was the first boxcar we saw. The infantry guys uh, ahead of us had opened some of the sliding doors of the various boxcars. And most of the boxcars, these boxcars were known as 40 and 8 cars. They accommodated 40 men, 40 soldiers, or 8 horses. And these this train left Buchenwald 20, 21 days earlier with about 100 prisoners, mostly all Jewish prisoners, stacked inside each one of the boxcars. Uh, they had no, all they had was a porcelain pot. That was the latrine, the bathroom. <laughs> they threw in some raw potatoes, a couple of loaves of black bread, and that was it. Now, mind you, this was wintertime. 
20 day journey, over 2000 of the prisoners, because there was a total of about 5,000 prisoners to start out with. I was read and told about later years. And they lost over 2,000 of the prisoners on the way that died from nutrition, freezing cold temperatures, and so forth. Uh, this, we had a little brownie box camera with us. This was, we only had the roll of film inside the camera when we liberated it. So we only took this one picture, which was donated in later years to the Holocaust Museum in Washington. This same picture you can find on the internet because the Army Signal Corps guys coming behind us and others took the same picture plus other cars, which I'll show. Next picture. This is a, another inside of one of the railroad boxcars. Next picture. Now I will say this, this, this picture, the, now the picture you're now seeing was taken by a soldier by the name of Don Patterson. I met him some years ago, introduced via telephone uh, by a mutual friend. Don Patterson was in a tank crew. Told me on the phone that his tank was on the way to Munich when they got orders to turn around and go back and enter the prisoner camp at Dachau. He said they arrived there about 4.30 that afternoon. And by five o'clock, he would start taking these pictures. Uh, Don had an official army camera and lots of film. His job uh, partially was to take pictures in combat, which he did. So he took these pictures, next picture, at Dachau. This is one of the rooms that contained dead bodies. Uh, the reason, and then the next picture, the reason why the dead bodies were in different places in addition to the railroad cars, there were bodies elsewhere around the camp was because four or five months previously, the Germans ran out of coal, so they couldn't operate the ovens. And of course, that's where the strong odor was coming from, from all these various dead bodies. This picture was taken the same afternoon outside the camp, gives you a, a better idea of the moat and the electrified fence and by that afternoon, maybe 5.30, 6 o'clock, when this picture was probably taken, the prisoners were coming out. Uh, I would tell you that as the SS and the German soldiers were leaving on the 28th, they fired at whatever prisoners they saw out in the prisoner camp outside the barracks and took one last shot at trying to kill them. When the U.S. Army arrived, uh, actually some of the infantry units were stationed in the wooded areas before Dachau to wait to determine if they got the word whether the camp was going to be peacefully surrendered or not, which the surrender was arranged. They got that word. So they entered the camp. The first infantry guys that entered the camp all that happened was there was some guards in one of the guard towers closest to the entrance and either they didn't get the word or they wanted to make a last stand. The first infantry guys, of course, had firepower and overwhelmed and took care of them and that was the extent of it. There have been stories told that uh, when the prisoners were, who were allowed to come out of the barracks, uh, they killed German soldiers. That is false, because there were no German soldiers left in the prisoner camp. There were some next door in the army camp, which the 45th Division entered that uh, army camp that morning, rounded up some German soldiers and took care of them expeditiously. Well, the ones that the prisoners did kill some in the prisoner camp was uh, 
uh, trustees, what we would call in our prisons in the States as trustees, they were called compos. And they were in charge of taking prisoners on various work details. And they were, in a lot of cases, they were more savage than the actual German soldiers. And that's why the prisoners rounded up some of them and killed them on the spot. Next picture. The rest of the pictures were taken five, a little over five years ago by my son. And I want to give you these pictures to show you. This is the entrance to the crematorium. Next picture. This is the crematorium itself. And we, every day we had a light rain. That's why you see umbrellas. Next picture. This is the room where the prisoners were told everything to remove everything and take a shower. Next picture. This is a picture of two of the three ovens. Next picture. I'm sorry, I must have skipped one here. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, next picture. Next picture. Saturday evening, the William Mola, the U.S. Uh, consul, had a Saturday night cocktail party in honor of the four or five, li there was five liberators present at the party. Next picture. Sit. On the bottom row is Pete Pettis, 42nd Division, then myself, and then uh, the next uh, is also um, U.S. Army soldier Frank Burns from Seattle, and the fourth liberator was Don Goodman, 45th Division, claimed he was at the liberation of Dachau. I had my doubts. Behind us are the U.S. Air Force and Army generals, and the last one on the right is a master sergeant. Next picture. This building is interesting. Uh, the occasion was the grand opening of this new museum, fantastic, the history of national socialism. The story on the plot of ground, the actual ground this museum was built on, was before the war, the Nazis took over a huge mansion called the Brown House on this same plot of ground, and that became the Nazi party headquarters in Munich. And it was destroyed during the war bombing, except for the basement area. Pete Pettis had an interesting story, which I don't have time to tell. Uh, he was ordered to take his platoon to locate the Brown House, thinking the military thought he may be able to locate some interesting uh, intelligence information there. Um, so the German government, the Bavarian government, decided to destroy that basement some years after the war, in more recent years, build this museum, which is a very interesting museum. Next picture. Don't have time to tell this story. Another interesting story that occurred during the war. Next picture. This is another sign uh, that's, I think, the same sign that occurred earlier. Also, too much time to read, don't have enough time to read. Next picture. Next picture. All right, this, the, the bold letters you can see are the different camps. Uh, Buchenwald, Mata, Bergen-Belsen, and uh, Flossberg, and down in the center below is Dachau. To the right is Mauthausen. All the little dots around every one of these camps were subcamps. Around Dachau, there was over 50 subcamps. They would take the prisoners 
from these different camps and put them in subcamps. The purpose was every near every subcamp was located various factories making different, especially uh, armaments, musicians for the German army. I talked to uh, one survivor of Dachau from Holland, and he told me, this was five years ago, a little over five years ago, he told me that he was in one of the sub camps of Dachau when he was sent from the main camp, and he worked in a BMW camp. He said, we made machines, engines, not for BMW automobiles, but for the German airplanes, the Luftwaffe. Uh, next picture. This is all that remains when you go there today. These are the foundations, concrete foundations of the original barracks. Uh, they destroyed some years after the war, they destroyed all the uh, barracks, buildings, claiming they were dilapidated. But I don't believe that either. Uh, my brother was there and for the 50th anniversary of the liberation in 1995, and this is what he saw at that time as well. Next picture. Okay, this is two replica barracks they constructed during the 1970s to show what the original barracks supposedly looked like. But of course, these were nice, new, and shiny. Next picture. Inside of the replica, the bunks shown. And of course, the prisoners were, each bunk contained three or four prisoners. They couldn't even turn over at night to sleep. There wasn't sufficient space. Next picture. This is the building known as the Your House. The building contained the SS officers and the entrance to the main gate of the prisoner camp. And once we saw the railroad boxcars uh, nearby, we saw this building and the entrance gate which happened to be open at the time, and we saw some infantry guys going through the gate. So my brother and I decided, okay, we'll follow them, which we did. And we went inside the camp, looked around, but I would tell you, every number one, everything was quiet. There was really nothing going on at the time. Because at that time, that was early that morning, and the soldiers in there uh, were waiting for further orders and waiting for other troops to arrive, which they did uh, momentarily, minute by minute, hour by hour, more troops arrived. Next picture. This was interesting. They had a, a huge uh, tent-like building that they constructed just for the occasion. And uh, you can see uh, on the right side, my daughter-in-law, Laurie, my wife, blonde haired against the wall on the right, then myself, Pete Pettis, and Frank Burns. Yop, the guy raising his hand, Yop Mezdek, is a young attorney, fairly young, from Holland. His uh, father was a survivor of Dachau. The lady taking the picture in the center. The interesting part there was after she took the picture of us, she stopped and people were leaving the hall at that point. She started singing, God bless America. And of course, everybody, every American that was still in the hall all joined in. Rather emotional moment when we all were singing, God bless America. Next picture. Sunday morning in the camp itself now, they have three different chapels like the one you're similar to the one you're seeing now. And one is Protestant, one is Catholic, and this one is Jewish. Next picture. For the occasion, so that Sunday morning, they, and each one, uh, one after, followed after another, they had a service, a short service. Uh, in the Jewish chapel, this 
picture I put in because Jerry and Roslyn Convoy were lighting a candle during the service. Jerry was a survivor of Doc Howe. And I asked him the same question I asked other survivors that I met. Where were you at and what were you doing early the morning of April 29th, 1945? Jerry said he wasn't in the camp. Well, where were you? Well, on the morning of the 28th, he was part of a couple thousand, about 3,000 Jewish prisoners that the SS officers and German, some German soldiers, all mostly riding. Some German soldiers were walking with the prisoners. The rest of them were all riding in different vehicles headed towards Austria. So he said, when they, just before they got, and some of them uh, died on the way, some of the prisoners died on the way, although the Germans took as many healthy looking prisoners as they could because they wanted to use them as slave labor, wherever they were going to end up. So he said, just before they got to the Austrian border, the Germans apparently got word that the 42nd Division troops were coming pretty close. So they all just suddenly took off. So he said that's when he was liberated in that spot with the other remaining prisoners. Next picture. This is inside the uh, administration building. I was scheduled for an interview by Chinese national television. And on my way to the interview, there was a Romanian uh, TV crew and they had just interviewed somebody. And when I passed by and they, all these young people stopped me to start asking me questions. I answered a few of their questions, but then I told them I had to excuse myself to go to the interview. Next picture. Skip. Next picture. This desk, this is the original, well, this picture here is at the entrance gate, Pete Pettis on my left, myself on the right. There again, it was a light rain. Uh, and as you can see, the sign on the gate, Arbeit macht free, which in German, work makes you free. Next picture. This was a sign about the gas chamber. Short sign, so everybody should be able to read it. Next picture. This is me. My son took this picture of me coming out of the uh, shower, so-called bras bad in German means a shower bath. And that's me coming out of that room, which was actually the gas chamber. They had uh, vents in the ceiling where they dropped the gas pellets down into the room to dispose. Next picture. All right, this is a typical one of the original guard towers. And this is typical of guard towers that you saw probably at every camp, whether it was a prisoner camp, POW camp, whatever. The ground floor was the bathroom. The second floor was the kitchen. And the top floor, we see the windows of where the guards were. Next picture. You can see this space was originally the moat. And of course, another guard tower. And of course, the both electrified fences on both sides of the moat. Next picture. Another sign. So I'm going to take a, a minute or two to read. Next picture. This story here, Sunday, this was taken Sunday morning after the service. They had me in a wheelchair because it was raining and a lot of water puddles when I got off the bus, asked me to sit in a wheelchair. I would tell you, after the service, uh, everybody was trying to get out. My son had parked me in the aisle because all the seats were taken. So I was sitting in the wheelchair in the aisle. People, the first ones trying to get out were the speakers. 
suddenly I looked up and there was Chancellor Angela Merkel standing alongside me. And I looked up at her, she looked down at me. She thanked me for my, for liberation. And I uh, thanked her for her remarks. Just a one minute uh, meeting with uh, Angela Merkel. This picture here, we came out, the younger lady came over, introduced the elderly lady as her mother, as a survivor of Dachau. The elderly lady, the survivor, thanked me for being a liberator of Dachau. And she leaned over and kissed me on both cheeks and said, if you guys were a couple of days later, I wouldn't have made it because in a very emotional moment, because I asked her the same question. Where were you at early the morning of April 29th, 1945? And her answer was she was so ill with typhus in the barracks. She didn't know what was going on inside the barracks, outside the barracks. She, was, she felt she was near death. And that's why she said what she told me that a couple of days later, she would have been gone. Next picture. Another sign will take a couple of minutes to let you read this one. Next picture. This is the last picture. Uh, my grandson, Adam, Margot on the left, my daughter-in-law, Laurie, myself, my wife, Betty Ann, my son, Jerry, and my granddaughter, Kelsey. Uh, all six of us, of course, were on the trip. The plaque you see on the wall behind us was installed and for the 50th anniversary of the liberation by the 42nd Division. It's in English, German, and I think French. Uh, just to note, stating the, recognizing the 42nd Infantry Division as the true liberators of the prisoner camp. Now, I think I've met uh, my time. I see it's five minutes to 12. Uh, I'll leave it up. You're good. We, uh, we do have a couple of questions that I'll start off and anybody that has other questions, if you'll uh, put them in chat, um, we'll get that to that. Uh, one of the first questions we got was, what were your, uh, I think you and I discussed this actually when, we, when I sat with you in your home, but uh, your, what were your initial reactions to seeing the carnage? Did you realize the serious scene you were seeing when you saw it for the first time? Well, I've been asked that question a number of times, various presentations. I would say especially high school students. Uh, you have to understand that we had seen, and I'm sure the infantry guys were the same way, and some of them that I've talked to over the years bear it out. You know, after you see so much death and destruction, uh, dead bodies, uh, dead horses, whatever, uh, you, you see more dead bodies and it's just more of the same. In other words, your initial shock is, of course, it already happened some time previously. So it, 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 was, it was nothing uh, momentous, I'll put it that way. Did you, uh, uh, let me press that a little bit. Did you realize this was a concentration camp that was used for the extermination of anybody, specifically Jews? Were you even aware of this at that time? We knew nothing about such camps. We had heard about them, but you have to understand for, you know, for a long period of time, many months, we were in training in Oklahoma for combat. The only information we got was the Stars and Stripes newspaper, which came once a week. And the articles were all about what was going on in Europe, European theater, what was going on in Pacific in combat, and very little about anything else. Uh, once a week, we 
went to the theater to see a, a movie. We had Fox Movie Tone News before the movie started. And there again, what was the Fox Movie Tone News? Mostly about combat pictures. Uh, you have to understand all these different concentration camps were not military objectives, not to liberate the camps. That was not military objective. The military objective was to liberate Europe from the Nazis and the German army. So we were now headquarters, division headquarters certainly knew about these camps, especially the ones that we were approaching in the area, regardless of what division was approaching another camp. So they knew. That's why when the surrender, officially surrender was noted, our headquarters, division headquarters was notified, our commanding general, General Harry Collins, ordered the assistant division commander, General Brigadier General Henning Linden, to show up about 2.30 the afternoon of the 29th with his, of course, bodyguards to accept the surrender. The surrender did not take place inside the prisoner camp. It either took place, one report I read said it took place outside the Dürer house, which I showed you the picture of, which was where the entrance to the camp was, or it took place um, actually uh, just inside the German army camp where this Lieutenant Weikert was. Next question. Uh, did you talk to any German civilians in the village of Dachau? Did you have a chance to talk to any civilians to ask them if they were aware of what was going on? Uh, no. Uh, the only time we actually talked to civilians was after the war ended. And this was, well, actually, the last days before VE Day. Uh, you know, there again, riding on a two-lane country road. Tremendous traffic jam, I would tell you, was just stop and go, mostly stop and a little go. The only time we stopped was when the guys ahead of us ran into some kind of temporary resistance, which didn't last long, and then we would move forward again. On both sides of the road, uh, in addition, well, first, uh, days, German soldiers were coming out of the woods on both sides to surrender with their arms up, hands up to surrendering. All we could do is motion to them to go back to the rear, point to them, just go to the rear. And then they apparently had left all their guns and ammunition in the woods wherever they came out of. That was followed by civilians on both sides of the road. And it, the civilians, for the most part, were hollering out in German, which my brother and I, by that time, were pretty well versed in German. Uh, and it was like they were all coached like a chorus. The war will not be over until you defeat the Russians. We heard that over and over. Huh. Uh, and after the war, and the Army of Occupation was when we did have the opportunity to talk to civilians. And of course, the first thing they told every one of them, I was not a Nazi. I was not a Nazi. We heard that over and over. Yeah. And they, you never, even after the war, were able to find anybody that was a civilian that lived in Dachau, the city of the town, that, I mean, obviously they had to have smelled the same thing you smelled, at least at some point. They had, well, they had no idea what they, was going on there or did they admit to it at all, the civilians, after the war even? No, they claimed not. You know, they were all in denial. Why not? Why, why? What was it to their advantage to come out and say, um, you know, I knew what was going on. Right, yeah. They treated, they treated the American soldiers, and I, especially, at least I can speak from the area I was in, as liberators, not as conquerors because they didn't want, they were deathly afraid of the Russians. They were very happy and pleased. They greeted us like liberators, American soldiers, as opposed to the Russians. 
Okay, um, here's what we're going to do. Um, if you'll all, those of you that want to stay, uh, you'll stay hooked up. And uh, Brian, if you'll show the last slide, um, we will um, uh, we will end the official portion of the meeting. Mr. Margold, uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you, not just the what you've shared with us today, but what little I've gotten to know you, I, I cannot tell you how much I'm impressed by and appreciate who you are. And thank you for sharing this this uh, this extremely important part of yourself with, with us. Um, if we could stand and applaud, we would, but it's all virtual weird stuff. So uh, I did, by the way, um, present Mr. Margo one of our books. Uh, he was gracious and acted like he liked it. I don't know if he did or not, but we'll see. <laughs> um, if you have any comments, feedback, uh, email it to me as usual. Uh, I have, we have recorded this. Um, I will make it available uh, for your review or to share with others after the meeting. And um, I would, uh, our next meeting is June, I'm sorry, July the um, 7th, I believe it is. And at this point, it's, um, I would say it's a zero possibility that we will meet at Dunwood United Methodist Church. Uh, maybe it's a 1%, but very little percentage, if any, that we'll actually meet there again in June, in July, but it, it may happen. So we're going to work on that and we'll figure out what to do for, for July and we'll keep you up to date. Um, uh, the last question before we completely sign off is, uh, Hilbert, did you have any, what we call today, what wasn't recognized as this term then, uh, PTSD or emotional, um, mental anguish that you had to struggle with? Uh, were you able to leave this behind and move on with your life when you came home? Or did you have ongoing issues of dealing with the uh, horrific um, experiences and particularly memories that you had of, of the war? Well, my answer is this. You have to realize that certainly my brother and I, every guy in my unit and probably every person serving in the military in World War II were children of the Depression. And a high percentage of us you know, came from families that well, we're either poor or close to it. So we were used to hardships. Those days, you know, what little we had, we enjoyed and we took care of. But we were used to hardships. And so when we went into combat, I think we were prepared uh, for what occurred. Example. Our gun crew, each gun crew consisted of 10 men, sergeant, corporal, and eight others, eight in uh, PFCs and privates. And we were, had to be on our howitzer 24 seven. We had our sleeping bag. We were, the only time we were more than a few feet or a couple yards away from being able to jump up morning, noon, or night for a fire mission was when we had to go to the bathroom. So because of that, uh, rain, sleet, snow, freezing temperatures, whatever, we were outside. The entire period of months that we were in combat, uh, we never stayed inside. Some of the infantry guys, I wouldn't say they had it better, but they could at least stay in some bombed out buildings, houses, whatever. Uh, our officers could, but we had to remain ready to fire as soon as we got a fire mission. So that's why we had to stay. But I think because of the background growing up during the depression years prepared us better. So I personally did not know of any guys. We, after the war, we had, every year we had a reunion, a 
42nd Division reunion somewhere in the United States for many, many years. They still have them. I just haven't attended them in many years. Mm-hmm. And Different. I spoke to anybody. I'm sorry, go ahead. They had a, you know, any kind of mental problems. Yeah. Um, is it true that the villagers, even though they denied knowing about what was going on at Dachau, they were uh, told to help bury bodies and also were any German soldiers used as labor to bury the bodies? Uh, I can only tell you what I personally witnessed and in the army of occupation, uh, we had nothing to do with any of that. And of course, you know, like Dachau, all the, the dead bodies, the pictures that I showed, uh, you could come there days, a week, maybe even 10 days later and see the same pictures, same dead bodies, because they didn't, they were dead already. The military units, especially the medic units came in and they were trying to save as many of the prisoners that were still alive and near death. Those were the ones they were taking and removing them back to the nearest field hospital and so forth. So anybody that arrived and General Eisenhower issued orders to commanding officers within a 50 mile radius of every prisoner camp to as many troops as they could spare. He wanted them to come and be witnesses to what they saw at the various, not only Dachau, but other camps as well. I have a question. Um, there are uh, the vast majority of the attendees of this session are Vietnam veterans. And there's obviously some family members that are younger and that sort of thing. But but your primary audience here are old guys like me. Um, but we have kids and grandkids. Um, what would you say would be the most important message that we could go out of our way to express, to communicate to younger generations today? Well, number one, being a member of the military is an honorable profession. And certainly it's needed. But no one that I know of wants war. So it's something as a last resort, not as a first action to go policing around the world. Number two, as I've stated, a lot of presentations and on the recent National Geographic program, which some of you may have witnessed. Uh, it's on the National Geographic TV recently. And they use this as a, the final quote of the program. And that is, I hope and pray that the offspring of my offspring and the offspring of everybody that I've spoken to outlive the offspring of the deniers that the Nazi atrocities didn't happen because they certainly did. Mm -hmm. Amen. I appreciate that very much. I totally agree. Um, Brian, if you will, um, we might have to say a short prayer about this, but if you will, um, allow our members to unmute themselves one at a time. Uh, I would suggest you might want to, two things, you might want to express your communi- your appreciation verbally, uh, if it doesn't get too chaotic. And secondly, if you email me um, anything you would like for me to make sure it gets passed on to Mr. Margold, I will make sure that he, he gets it. I, I cannot tell you how much, uh, Mr. Margold, we appreciate your uh, what you've been through, but uh, the fact that you're willing to share that with us and take the time to do this, we really appreciate it. So if you'll, um, if you have a comment you'd like to make, you are now available to unmute yourself. So we'll see how that goes. Tom, what, uh, what time will the board meeting start? 
of 30. John Gilbert. Um, Hilly, I want to thank you again. This is now the third time I've heard uh, this, this story. Um, I watch the National Geographic as well. Uh, you're a great guy, and I'll tell you what, you're 96 years old, you look fantastic. Keep it up, bud. Must be that good Army training. Mm -hmm. Kerry, you look good for 96, too, by the way. Well, <laughs> you know, actually, I'm, I'm rounding the corner for 200. That's the way I feel right now. <laughs> we can be sheltered in place, and I will be 200. <coughs> Thank you, Kerry. For those of you that are going to be in the board meeting or the leadership meeting, uh, the board meeting basically at 1230, there's a separate link for that. You, you should have gotten, well, you did get an email with a link for that. Um, and yes, if I have to, I'll send it again. But there is a separate link. It's a different e-meeting ID for the meeting that starts at 1230. Done. John, can I ask a question of uh, Mr. Margo? Mr. Margo, uh, I know you and your brother are Jewish, and uh, what? How did you react to seeing all of these Jewish people uh, uh, in this condition, this situation? And did you reach out to them? With, uh, what kind of um, uh, interaction did you have with them because of uh, your shared religion? What period are you talking about? I'm sorry. And, uh, and what time? And those okay. at, at the liber at the liberation, when you first met uh, the concentration camp survivors, the interaction that you had with them, uh, how emotional it was. Uh, okay, you're talking about five, a little over five years ago at Dachau. <laughs> uh, well, there were several that I asked the same question. While they answered it, they acted like they didn't want to talk any further, and I respected that. There was one guy in particular that told me that he was in that train, one of the boxcars called, referred to after the war as the death train. He said he was one of 16 survivors although I've read articles where there was more than 16 survivors. But he said he was one of 16 survivors who came out of the boxcar at Dachau. And he said they got out of the boxcar and they were taken into a building which no longer exists. It was next door to the Ur house, which was where the entrance was for interview. And I wasn't sure, some of the things he did say, I wasn't sure if he was telling me the truth. So I said, well, I understood there was another train that was in the railroad station at Dachau itself. Was that the train you were in? He said, oh no, I was in the train near the prisoner camp. So to test him, I said, can you tell me approximately how far you were when you got out of the boxcar to the entrance gate into the prisoner camp. He thought a few seconds, he says, about 25 or 30 yards. Well, that rang a bell with me because that was coincided with my memory. So that convinced me that he was telling me the truth. But at that point, he didn't act like he wanted to talk any further. There was one other survivor, tall guy from California. I've seen him on a video, a YouTube video on the internet. And he sat next to me at the Sunday morning service. He was carrying a small Israeli flag on a tree branch sitting there right on my left. And there again, I tried to talk to him, but he acted like he didn't want to talk or answer any questions. So there again, I thought it may be too painful for him. And I respected that. But 
I had one incident, so I'll take a couple of minutes, after the war, uh, the fall of 1945, September, October, every U.S. Army division in Europe formed a football squad. Uh, I was fortunate to get on the 42nd Infantry Division football team. Our training camp was in a village above Salzburg in the Austrian Alps, Bodgerstein. They had previously, they had transported a bunch of Jewish survivors to Bodgerstein and Hofgerstein. Both of them were luxury hotels, health spas, very famous pre-war in Europe. So that our football team put, uh, stayed in one of those luxury hotels. So I had a roommate, he was not a, a player on the team, he was an equipment manager. He and I were walking in Bodgerstein one afternoon and some of the survivors that had been taken there and several of the other hotels came walking towards us. And I stopped and talked to him in my limited German, Yiddish combination, and just a brief conversation, wishing them well. And we walked away and he turned to me and he said, well, I guess Hitler didn't get them all. Well, of course, he didn't realize that I was Jewish. So I told him, I said, you know, I'm sorry, but apparently you don't know I'm Jewish and you just offended me. Well, he didn't know what to do. He didn't know how to react. So he just walked away and for close to, I don't know, 10 days or so, even though he was my roommate, he avoided me as much as possible. He just didn't know how to handle it. So about the ninth or 10th day, I told him, I said, look, we have to talk, reach an understanding here. So we had a nice conversation. He went on to explain to me that he was born and raised on a farm somewhere in Kansas. And occasionally his father would hitch up the wagon to go into town to buy accessories and provisions for the farm. And occasionally he would go with his father and they would go to a clothing store to buy some clothing for family members, the other kids, whatnot, other stores, but all the way back to the farm riding on the wagon, every trip his father would repeat the same message that here the farmers, poor farmers work so hard, have very little to show for it. And they go into this clothing store, especially owned by Jewish family. They have life so easy. They make so much money off the poor farmers. And he, he heard that over and over. He says he never had any relationship with any Jewish person growing up, but that's the upbringing that he experienced and that was behind his remark. Mm -hmm. So from that point on, we had a friendly relationship for the rest of the season. That's another thing that stuck out in my mind. John, I don't, know how much more time we have and I'll accept any more questions, but if you, if you want me to, I'll tell the brief story about that Army five-gallon water can. I think that would be very appropriate. That'd be a great way to end this, uh, this session. Okay. Because that's a great story. And everybody in this, on this call recognizes that five-gallon can. All right. Okay. Well, you know, I guess in, every military unit, they have five gallon water cans. In our case, the, four ga the five gallon water cans were for two purposes, one for drinking purposes, and then after every so many firing missions, we had to wash out the gun bore of the howitzers to get rid of the powder residue. Here's the, guy, the picture of the can, water can. Well, when we, the division captured Wartburg, and it was under control, we were notified that we had a day and a half of rest. So 
two of our, uh, the Tom Dahl from Cincinnati, my truck driver, and one of the supply truck drivers, the two of them went into a nearby building, it turned out to be a warehouse, and they saw uh, cases of French champagne, also cases, miniature jugs of various fruit brandies. So they loaded as many of those crates as they could on the two trucks, brought them back to our gun position. So once we realized we had all this French champagne, we emptied out all the water cans, filled them with French champagne. Because for drinking purposes, every time we had an opportunity to refill the cans, we had to dump in, drop in chlorine tablets to purify the water for drinking purposes, but it didn't taste too good. So of course that French champagne would taste a lot better than that chlorinated water. We also felt it would do a better job of cleaning out the gun bores. <laughs> so everything was fine until the guys started drinking. Fortunately, we had this rest period. The guys started drinking the fruit brandies, and most of them thought it was like fruit punch, apricot brandy, cherry brandy, and stuff like that. So it didn't take too long. Out of the 100 men in the battery, about 90 of them got drunk. <laughs> so we had some experiences there that took place. That was the story of the water can. <laughs> thank you. Mr. Margold, again, thank you so much. Uh, God bless you. Uh, it's, it's been wonderful to be with you virtually, almost as great as it was to be with you in your garage. <laughs> <laughs> well, the guys, just to know, our garage is our pandemic dining room. When our kids take turns coming over, they bring dinner, and that's where we have our dinner in our in our garage, so we can maintain that distance. And he's classy yeah. enough that the floor of the garage, you could eat off the floor of his garage. It's, <laughs> it's magnificent. <laughs> Not that you would want to eat off the floor of the garage, but you could, right? Thanks a lot, but no thanks, John. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll leave out and leave you guys to be, and thank, thanks for all of you for listening. Appreciate it. God thank you. Thank you, Hilbert, so much. We'll see you. You all stay well. All right.